We have a definition of derivative now. We've seen that it is a kind of rate of change, or it gives us a formula for slopes of tangent lines. Now we have to learn more techniques on how to actually calculate that derivative. And now we'll see a, a number of these techniques. What you need to remember at this point is that these techniques, once you've seen them, you need to practice. Practice them until they become second nature. Once they do, it'll make the rest of the course easier. So we'll start with some basic rules. The very first rule is the power rule. And the power rule says, let us consider the following whole class of functions, or family of functions. f of x equal x to the n, and we'll just for now look at the cases where n is 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. Now the powers n can be other numbers, but we'll deal with those later. For now, we'll just take 0 or any positive integer. The question is, what is the derivative of a function of this sort? Now we're going to learn a nice rule, but we're going to build up to it. First, let's take the n equals 0 case. So that would be f of x equals x to the 0, which, as you know, is going to be 1, provided, or whenever, x is not equal to 0. Now, that function should be easy to find the derivative of. I'm going to do it two ways. First, we'll just go ahead and do the calculation by the definition. It's nice to see what the definition actually gives us, and then to verify it by looking at a picture. So here is the definition, which remember, just write it out again, the limit of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. By now, this should be very common to you. We have now the limit as h goes to 0. f of x plus h. Well, f of x is the function that is 1. It is always 1. It doesn't matter what the x value is. It is always 1, assuming the x is not 0, which we always assume, which means f of x plus h is 1, minus f of x, which is 1 all over h. That means the top of this fraction is always 0, which means the fraction is always 0. So we are taking the limit of something that is always 0, and the limit has no effect on it, which means this is 0 always. Why would that seem obvious? Well, if we look at a graph of this function, that explains that completely. Here is the height 1. Here is the graph of the function f of x equal 1. It is a height of 1 everywhere. And what is the slope? of this line. Well, the slope equals 0 everywhere. And since the derivative of a function like this is supposed to give us the slope of the line everywhere, in this case it certainly does. It gives us the slope of 0, which is what we should expect. Another way one might write this derivative, just to remind you of this, is to say the derivative of the function that is always equal to 1 is equal to 0. Now. That takes care of the power rule for x to the 0 power. Let us extend it one step further. Let us observe, before we even get to higher powers, we can do a little bit more with this first one. Observe further that if we start with a graph that is the graph of any horizontal line, say at a height of c. Now I've drawn my c here to be a positive c, it could be also down here. The point is that the function f of x equals c has a horizontal line as its graph. What is the slope of this line? Well, just as the one before, the slope is 0. So we have discovered from this, because the slope is equal to 0 everywhere, it seems that we have a little bit extended rule that says if you take the derivative of a function that's equal to any constant whatsoever, you should get 0. And that's for all real numbers c. So we have a rule here that is the first of the rules we'll be examining. It's a very basic rule. It says if you take the derivative of a constant, or a function that's always equal to a constant, you always get 0. That's easy. Now, what about the n equal 1 case? That would be where f of x is equal to x to the 1 power, and when it's 1 power, we don't write the 1. Well, to find this, we'll go ahead and look at a picture yet again. The graph of the f of x equal x function, which is the y equals x function, is just this 45 degree line. And we know the slope of that line. The slope of that line is equal to 1 always. Lines always have one slope, of course, and the slope of this line is always equal to 1. So without any work, and without verifying it with the definition, which we don't really need to do, 
we have discovered that the derivative of the function x is equal to 1 always. So there's a second one that was easy. Now, you don't want to conclude from this that all derivatives are going to be constants. The derivative of a constant is, in fact, 0, which is constant. The derivative of x is 1, which is constant. But most functions are not going to be lines. They're going to be curves, and the slope of the tangent line will change. And so we'll have to develop a more general formula. So for the cases now, n equal 2, 3, and so on, we can do the whole argument at once. What we need to do is to find the derivative of x to the n using this notation. That's the function f of x equals x to the n, where the n is 2, 3, or so on. How are we going to do that? Well, we can't resort to looking at pictures this time. We'll have to go back to the definition. So first of all, we need to recall some algebra. Once we have these rules, we can avoid a lot of this algebra. But right now, we have to actually walk our way through it and use the algebra. Here's the algebra I'd like you to think of. If you have some number a to the n minus b to the n, you have what's sometimes referred to as a difference of two powers. And in this case, rather than being two powers of 1 or 2 or 3, which you may have seen, this is a difference of two nth powers. Now, in algebra, you learn that this can be factored. First of all, in a difference of two powers, one factor is always a minus b. The other factor is longer, but it follows a nice pattern. It starts with a to the n minus 1, because a times a to the n minus 1 has to give you back the a here, a to the n here. And then what happens is you take powers of a to the n minus 1, and they will then go down. And powers of b now will grow. Here, the power of b is b to the 0. Here, a to the n minus 2, the power has gone down. The b power has now gone up to 1. Plus, dot, 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 plus, when we get to the end, the power of a has dropped down to a to the 1. b has risen, a to b to the n minus 2. And finally, we have b to the n minus 1, where the power of a has dropped to 0. And notice that in each expression, the powers add up to n minus 1. n minus 2 plus 1 is n minus 1. 1 plus n minus 2 is n minus 1, and so on. So this is a common piece of algebra. And we will be using it now to do what we want to do with our derivative rule. So here is the theorem that gives us what we call the power rule. If n is equal to, and this actually works for 1 also, n equal 1, 2, 3, etc. Then the rule is very simple. It's a rule anyone who's ever taken calculus learns very quickly. The derivative of x to the n is equal to n x to the n minus 1. So what this says is that if you have x to the n, you take the power, bring it down out front as a constant in front, and then subtract 1 from the power to get a new power. This rule is very easy to apply. But in calculus, as everywhere else, you ha should have a sense of where these rules come from. Not that you'll have to prove this all the time, but you should feel that this rule is not arbitrary or miraculous. It actually has a proof. So we'll show you the proof here as quickly as we can. So here's the proof. The derivative of x to the n, well, again, we have no technique at this point, so we have to go back to the definition. So this is the limit as h goes to 0 of the function, which is x to the n, so that will be x plus h to the n here, minus x to the n, all over h. And now you see why I did the algebra earlier, because here I have the difference of two nth powers. I need to simplify this in order to complete this limit. Because as it stands, with the bottom going to 0, I cannot do this limit. So I will use what I learned earlier. The limit as h goes to 0, I will again, as I usually do, pull out my 1 over h. Now, if this is like an a to the n minus b to the n, the first factor is going to be the a part, x plus h, minus the b part, which is x. Now, that's going to work out nicely. Times the remaining part, which will be x plus h to the n minus 1, plus x plus h to the n minus 2 times x, plus dot, 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 plus x plus h to the x times x to the n minus 2, plus finally x to the n minus 1. And catch up on all my various brackets here. Now, 
we can see a few things happen very quickly. x plus h minus x is just h, and then 1 over h times h is 1, so this whole expression just becomes a 1. Also, while we're here, all these expressions that have h's in them, if the h goes to 0, instead of x plus h to the n minus 1, for example, I will have x to the n minus 1. This one will become x to the n minus 2, and so on. So after taking the limit, I end up with x to the n minus 1, that's this first term, plus x to the n minus 2 times x, that's the second term, plus dot 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 plus, here this becomes x times x to the n minus 2, that's this term, plus finally x to the n minus 1. Now notice here that all of these terms are exactly the same. This is x to the n minus 1, this is x to the n minus 2 times x, which is also x to the n minus 1, as is this one and this one. The only question is, how many of these do I have? Well, if I count downward, starting from the first term here, I see that I have n minus 1, n minus 2, all the way down to 1. So from here to here, I have n minus 1 terms and one more. So I have a total of n terms. And they're all the same, so this is n times x to the n minus 1. And that's exactly what we expected. So that is the proof of the power rule. This rule here is called the power rule. Let's practice it a little bit in a moment. But let me add one more thing to it to extend it a bit. This power rule, the derivative of x to the n is equal to n x to the n, n minus 1, is also true for all integers. Meaning, n can be 0, it can be plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, and so on. So in addition to the 0, 1, 2, which we've already proved it for, the negative numbers are all allowed. There is a question later whether this kind of a rule works when n would be a fraction, or perhaps an irrational number, and we'll deal with those at a separate time. But for now, we have this nice compact rule that works for all integers. So, for example, we can take some very simple things. The derivative, say, of x to the fifth is just 5x to the fourth. The 5 comes down, and then the power is dropped by 1. Simple as that. If you have the derivative with respect to t of t to the 13th, you have 13t to the 12th. So the 13 comes down, the 13 is dropped to 12. What about something like this? The derivative with respect to y of, say, y to the minus 2. Well, we have a negative power, but that doesn't stop us. The same rule works. It's now going to be minus 2 times y. And we remember now, you have to remember the rule correctly, we're subtracting 1 from the power. So minus 2 minus 1 gives me minus 3. Be careful there. Remember, you're subtracting 1 from the power. When it's a 5, you're subtracting 1 and you get a 4. When it is a 13, you subtract 1 and get a 12. When it's a minus 2 and you subtract 1, you get a minus 3. So the power numerically gets bigger. Be careful that you do that correctly. Now on to a few other rules. The next in our sequence of rules, we'll put all together the constant multiple, sum, and different rule, difference rules. And I'll put this all together in one large theorem that goes like this, and then we'll practice. If you have a couple of functions, f and g, and these functions are differentiable, differentiable at a point x. And differentiable means that these functions have a derivative at x. And I will also need a number here. And c is any real number. Then we get the following. Three rules that you will use repeatedly. The first rule is very, very nice. Suppose you have this constant times some function. Could be f, could be g, it doesn't matter. If you have the derivative of a constant times a function, you can take the constant out of your face. You can take it out of the problem out front. So you can write c times the derivative with respect to x of f of x. So if any function whatsoever is multiplied by a constant, just pull the constant out front and then concentrate on taking the derivative of the function. Then. If you have two functions which have derivatives, then it is possible to differentiate the sum of the two functions. And the derivative works out exactly as you hope it would. 
It is the derivative of the first one plus the derivative of the second one. Just that simple. So this allows you to break up something that is added into a sum of two derivatives. That simplifies things. And finally, the same rule works if you subtract two functions. And that is the difference of f and g. That is exactly what you'd expect it to be. The derivative of f of x minus the derivative of g of x. Why would we want to have these rules clarified at this point? Well, if you think about it, what sorts of objects have sums or differences possibly multiplied by numbers? And if we go back to the power rule, possibly have powers. Well, now we can differentiate or find the derivative of polynomials, our favorite sorts of functions. We can now differentiate them because we have all the steps we need. So let's illustrate that with an example. Suppose I want to find the derivative of the following polynomial. And I'll spread it out a little bit here so I can show you what's happening in detail. This is, again, a situation where you want to practice this so that all of this becomes clear. Now, I have a polynomial 5x to the fourth minus x cubed plus 2x plus pi. Pi is a constant, of course, so it doesn't really matter what I put there as a constant. So here's my polynomial, and I want its derivative. By using all of the rules we've just developed, I can find this derivative. Watch how this happens. In this first expression here, this first term, I have 5 times x to the fourth. That has a constant out front, and we just learned the constant remains and can be pulled out in front of the derivative, so I can write the 5 down with no change. Then I concentrate on the function x to the fourth. Well, I know how to take that derivative. That is 4 times x cubed. And I'll even put it in parentheses here to keep it separate. So I have had the 5, which remains because of the constant rule constant multiple rule, and I have x to the fourth has derivative 4x cubed by the power rule. Then we had a difference rule that said if you have the difference of two functions, it is, or if you want the derivative of the difference, it is the difference of the derivatives. So here's the difference right here. And then what's the derivative of x cubed? It is 3x squared again by the power rule. We had a sum rule that said the uh, the derivative of the sum is the sum of derivatives, so there's the sum. The derivative of 2x, well, the 2 is a constant. Again, the constant comes out front. Then we find the derivative of x, which we've also done. It's a power, x to the 1 after all. And we found that that derivative was 1. And so this comes down to here. This plus then also comes down, because just like here, it's a sum of derivatives. And then the derivative of a constant is 0, something we also did before. So we have now taken the derivative of the function, this polynomial. You can simplify this if that is what you'd like at this point. So we can write 20 times x cubed, 3x squared, minus 3x squared, plus 2, and say that is where we end, and that's correct. But look at the process here and keep that in mind. We are taking this derivative of this large function by breaking it up into separate pieces and keeping track of all the separate pieces. And as I take the derivative, notice that the derivative symbol, which should be obvious, is going to disappear. This says take the derivative of this. Here I've done it, so I don't need the derivative symbol anymore. And when I get to this stage, technically I'm done. This is a perfectly correct answer. What we like to do, though, is simplify things as much as possible, because we'll probably, in most problems, be using this for something else. So let's stop there. Sometimes we start with a derivative, which is a function, and ask ourselves, what is its derivative? And then we might repeat that process. So we should probably have some notation for that. And that's what we'll look at now before we go any further. The notation for derivatives of derivatives. Now, first derivative, which is what we've been doing so far. And we didn't think of it as first because it was the only derivative we were doing. But now we want to think of it as the first derivative. We have notation for this. For example, we write f prime of x. We might write the derivative with respect to x of f of x as an alternate notation. We might write y prime if we've written y equals f of x earlier. We might then write the derivative with respect to x of y more commonly written as dy dx. 
But when you write this, remember that you want to think of it this way. This is like a derivative operator, which changes this function y into its derivative y prime. That is the first derivative. Let us go to the second derivative to start developing a pattern for higher order derivatives. For the prime notation, one can just write another prime and say f double prime gives you the second derivative, which would be the derivative of the first derivative function. Now you can already see that this is going to cause problems. If we wanted third, fourth, and fifth derivatives, we'd have too many primes and the notation gets awkward. So we'll have to alter that in a minute. What, what happens here? Well, if this is the operator that operates on the function to give the derivative, if we want the second derivative, it would seem that we just want to apply the operator a second time. So we take the derivative with respect to x of the derivative with respect to x of f of x. And what this is usually written as, as what looks like d squared over dx squared of f of x. Now that makes sense on the top. There are two d's here. It looks like d times d. It really isn't d times d, because this is not a variable times a variable. This is how the notation is written, but just multiplication, it isn't multiplication. And on the bottom, this is dx times dx, traditionally written dx with a 2 like this, without a parenthesis around the dx as we might normally write such things. But this is not multiplication, remember. This is this operation applied twice. So you start with the original derivative and take its derivative. And then you have this notation. If you do it with the y's, you'd have y double prime. And then the second one, if you took the derivative of the derivative with respect to y, then the notation is just like the one above. It's the second derivative of y with respect to x. And you see what I read there. I said the second derivative of y with respect to x. At no point did I say d squared over dx squared. So learn the language that goes with this so that'll help you avoid some of the issues you may have about this being multiplication. Now, this takes care of first derivative and second derivative. What if you go higher? Well, we need to be a little more careful and get something that will generalize nicely. So for higher derivatives, here's what we do. We write f, and instead of having n primes up here, which is awkward, we simply put n, but put it in parentheses of x. Now, by putting it in parentheses, reminds us that this is not any other kind of operation. The only time you'd put an n superscript in parentheses if you want to take derivatives. So this is special to that. Then for the y case, we might write the nth derivative of y with respect to x, with the n's in those positions. Or we might write the nth derivative with respect to x of f of x in this fashion. The n there, of course, can be 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Generally, in calculus, you're not going to be taking much more than the second derivative. Occasionally, you take the third and fourth for practice. But in most applications, you never get beyond the second derivative. But you should be aware of the notation. Here's a simple example to illustrate how this works. If you have f of x equals, say, a nice polynomial like 3x to the fourth minus 2x cubed plus x squared minus 4x plus 2, then let's just calculate all of its derivatives. The first derivative is going to be 3 left alone, and then the derivative of x to the fourth is 4x cubed. So the 3 times the 4 gives me 12x cubed. Minus the same sort of thing happens here, and I end up with 6x squared plus 2x minus 4. The second derivative, and I'll still use the double prime here, is going to be 36x squared minus 12x plus 2. For the third derivative, I'll go ahead and adopt that parenthetical notation. So third derivative of f will be 72x minus 12. The fourth derivative of x will then be 72. And then I'm going to claim that the nth derivative of x is 0 for all n that are 5, 6, 7, and so on. And that's because the derivative of 72, which is a constant, is 0. And then the derivative of 0, which is a constant, is 0. And that will remain 0 from then on. 
So although I set what looked like an impossible task, find all infinitely many derivatives of this function, it turned out that only these first few actually gave me numbers that weren't zero. And all the rest, the infinitely many rest, are all zero. So that turns out to be easier than it looked. I think it'll be time in a moment for some more exercises. Next, some exercises. First, let's pose this problem. Show that the function y equals x cubed plus 3x plus 1 satisfies the following equation. The third derivative of y plus x times y double prime, the second derivative of y, minus 2y prime, the first derivative of y, equals 0. So you want to show that this equation is satisfied by this particular function y. Try that. We have to show that this function satisfies this second equation. What does satisfy mean? It means if I start with this value of y and produce its third derivative, its second derivative, and its first derivative, and if I substitute those into this expression, I should get 0. In order to do this, I'm going to have to compute the first, second, and third derivative, so let's do that first. So my answer here will be, first of all, to compute the derivatives. So y prime is what? Well, here's my original. The derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. The sum is the sum of derivatives, so I can put a plus there. The derivative of 3x is 3 times 1, or 3. And then the derivative of 1, of course, is 0. So there is my first derivative. What is my second derivative? The second derivative is going to be 3 left alone times the derivative of x squared, which is 2x, which gives me 6x. And again, the derivative of the plus 3, a constant, is 0. And finally, the third derivative is just the derivative of 6x, which is just 6. So with those three derivatives, let's see if I put them in this equation whether or not I get 0. The equation begins with the third derivative, which is 6 plus x times the second derivative, which is 6x, minus 2 times the first derivative, which is 3x squared plus 3. Let's simplify this and see what happens. This is 6 plus x times 6x is 6x squared. Here we have minus 2 times 3x squared, which is minus 6x squared, minus 2 times 3, which is minus 6. Well, look, that adds up to 0. So we have verified that this equation, which by the way is called a differential equation, this equation is satisfied by this original function. So there's a nice bit of practice with derivatives for you. Let us now look at a second question. This is a question involving a spherical balloon. So let us suppose we have a spherical balloon of radius r and volume given by v equals 4 thirds pi r cubed. Now that spherical balloon of radius r and volume v equals 4 thirds pi r cubed is being inflated. Okay, there is a situation. Now, here is what we want to do. Find a general formula for the instantaneous rate of change, the instantaneous rate of change of v, the variable, with respect to r, the other variable. Now this is a question in which you'll have to read this and abstract the mathematics out of it and then solve the problem using the information we've had previously about derivatives. So a spherical balloon of radius r and volume v equals 4 thirds pi r cubed is being inflated. Find the general formula for the instantaneous rate of change of v with respect to r. Although this problem seems to take quite a while to state, it's really not very hard when you start to think about it. It's a matter of interpreting the words correctly. We want to find a general formula for the instantaneous rate of change. That is code for the derivative. 
because instantaneous rate of change is the same thing we used before for instantaneous velocity, and all of those things turned out to be what we now call the derivative. So I want the instantaneous rate of change, or derivative, of v with respect to r. So what I want to do is I want to find dv dr. So we are given that v is equal to 4 thirds pi r cubed. If you recognize that 4 thirds pi is a constant, then when I take the derivative dv dr, I realize that the constant remains out front, untouched. And then I need to take the derivative of r cubed with respect to r. That's just the power rule. So that'll be 3 times r squared. And if I simplify a little bit, I see that 3 over 3 is 1. So I end up with 4 pi r squared. And I have now found the instantaneous rate of change of the volume with respect to the radius. It is given by this formula. And if I had particular numbers r and v around, I could actually do some calculations and get some numbers. But now I have a formula for that instantaneous rate of change, instantaneous rate of change, which is all that I was looking for. And that's that. It's time to continue finding more rules for finding derivatives. We're calling this part finding derivatives two. And the first is a big rule that's well known and one you'll use a lot, the product rule. What do you do when you have the product of two functions? First, let me address the question that is probably in the back of your mind. We have a rule that says, if you have the derivative of the sum of two functions, then that is the sum of the derivatives of the two functions. It also works for differences. Your natural inclination is to say, the derivative of a product of two functions ought to be the product of the derivatives of the two functions. That would seem natural. However, it isn't true. So let me write that down and then show you an example to prove to you that that is a naive notion that we need to find some better way to express. So if I want the derivative of a product, I will show you that it is not equal in general to the derivative of the original function f times the derivative of the other function g of x. Now all I have to do is come up with a single example. So this will be my counterexample to your expectation that the product rule might be this. My counterexample is this. Let f of x be equal to the simple function 1, the constant function 1. And we will let g of x be another simple function, say, x. And almost any two functions you choose will show that this fails. But these are nice and simple. So now let's look at the left-hand side, which would be the derivative of f of x, which is 1, times g of x, which is x. We will put an equal sign in a question mark and see if we can discover whether it's equal or not to the derivative of the f function, which is 1, times the derivative of the g function, which is x. Now on the left, we have 1 times x, which is x. And we know the derivative of x. The derivative of x is 1. So is that equal to the other side? Well, let's see. The derivative of 1 is 0. 1 is a constant function. It has slope 0 everywhere, times the derivative of x, which is 1. So the question is, does 1 equal 0, and of course, 1 doesn't equal 0. So we have just shown in the simplest possible manner that this purported rule cannot be correct. The derivative of a product, unfortunately, is not equal to the product of the derivatives. So what is it? Well, here's the theorem that expresses what it is. And we'll start with the usual hypothesis. Suppose we have f and g, and they're both differentiable, and I'm going to abbreviate differentiable by diff at x. Then the derivative of the product, which is what we're interested in here, the derivative of f of x times g of x, actually exists and equals this expression. It is the original function f of x untouched, no derivative, times the derivative of the second function g of x, plus g of x now untouched, that's the second function, times the derivative with respect to x of the first function. That is how the product rule works. 
you leave one function alone, multiply it times the derivative of the other function, and add to that the other function multiplied times the derivative of the first. We will practice this, but this is how it looks in fact. Here is the proof. Since the rule is counterintuitive, perhaps, to what you expected before, we're going to give the proof so you can see where this comes from. This isn't a mystery. So, how do we begin this? Well, we'll say the derivative with respect to x of f of x times g of x is equal to, well, we have only the derivative definition. So we have the limit as h goes to 0 of an expression, which will be all over h, of course. And what do we put in here? We're supposed to put the function evaluated at x plus h here. What is the function here? The function is really the product of these two functions. So we have to replace all the x's in here by x plus h. So this will be f of x plus h times g of x plus h. Then from that we subtract the original function, which is just f of x times g of x. Now, in order to go any further, we're going to have to be a little clever. And here is the bit of cleverness. This is equal to the limit as x h goes to 0 of the following. And all I'm going to do is add and subtract a number to the top or the numerator. That will make a net change of 0, so nothing will be changed here. But it will allow me to break this down into a different form, which will be helpful. So this first expression is not changed, f of x plus h and g of x plus h multiplied, stays there. At the end, I will have minus f of x times g of x. That also will not change. Now, what am I going to add and subtract? Watch this. I'm going to first subtract f of x plus h times g of x, and I will add the same thing, f of x plus h times g of x. So this in here is the subtraction and the addition of the same expression, this f of x plus h times g of x. Why do I bother? Here's why. If I then break this apart into two fractions, which will go from here to here over h, and then a second fraction, which will go from here to here over h, you'll see what happens. Notice in this first fraction that f of x plus h is common, so I can factor that out front. In the second fraction, it's g of x which is common, and I will factor that out front. That will lead me to the following expression, and I will spread the limit out over the various parts. So I will have the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h, which I said I would factor out, times the limit of what remains, which is the limit as h goes to 0 of g of x plus h minus g of x all over h, and then plus the limit as h goes to 0 of g of x, which I said I would factor out, times the limit as h goes to 0 of what's left, which is f of x plus h minus f of x, all over h. Now, what happens here? As h goes to 0, this first expression just becomes f of x. And the reason that actually happens is because f of x has a derivative, therefore f of x is continuous. And this actually is the definition of being continuous at x. So you can imagine that the h goes to 0, and I'm left with f of x times, what is this expression? Well, you should recognize this. This is exactly the definition of the derivative of g. g of x plus h minus g of x over h, and the limit as h goes to 0. So this is the derivative of g. Plus, here we have the limit of g of x as h goes to 0. Well, there's no h here, so the limit doesn't affect this at all. So this just stays g of x. And then this limit is, again, you sh one you should recognize. This is the derivative of f. So this is the derivative of f of x. And look, this is exactly the rule, the product rule we were trying to get to. So this is the derivative of a product of f of x and g of x. f of x left alone times the derivative of g plus g of x left alone times the derivative of f. That's the rule that you want to remember and practice. And now you've seen where it comes from. I might note while I'm here that sometimes we write this, sometimes, in order to simplify the notation a little, if I call f of x the function u and don't mention the x, and if I call g of x the function v and don't mention the x, you can write this a little more simply 
as the derivative with respect to x of uv, u times v, is u dv dx plus v du dx. And you might notice that has a certain verbal rhythm to it. The derivative of uv is u dv dx plus v du dx. Sometimes that is helpful to remember that as a phrase in your mind to remember how the product rule goes. Now let's look at an example. Find dy dx. That is the derivative. And here is the function given to us. y is equal to the product of 4x squared minus 1 and 7x cubed plus x. So this is a product, and we want to find its derivative. Now, of course, at this stage of the game, you could easily multiply this out, get a large polynomial, and then take its derivative using rules we've had before the product rule. No question about that. But let's practice the product rule, because over time, it will become very important. And then, if you wanted to, you could verify that this is correct by multiplying it out and then finding the derivative a second way by using what we know about how to find the derivative of a polynomial. We'll use the product rule, however. So dy dx, the product rule says, leave the first expression alone. So that's 4x squared minus 1 untouched, times the derivative of the second expression. Now the second expression is a polynomial, and I know how to take that derivative. The 7 remains. The derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. So I have here 21x squared plus the derivative of x, which is 1. The product rule then says, add to that the reverse process. Instead of leaving the first alone and the derivative of the second, we now leave the second alone, 7x cubed plus x, and multiply it times the derivative of the first. Again, this is a polynomial. 4x squared, that's 4 left alone. x squared is 2x, so this is 8x minus 0, because the derivative of 1 is 0. This is the derivative of this function. This is the original function that was on the left, untouched. This is the original function that was on the right, untouched. This is the derivative of the second function. This is the derivative of the first function. Now at this stage, if you wanted to, you could simplify this further, multiplying it out to whatever degree makes you happy. We're going to stop here because we've done what we set out to do, which was find the derivative of this particular product. Let's do another one before we leave this. Find ds dt. That should remind you of notation we've used before. Remember, we use s to stand for position function and t for time. And this will happen in such functions. Suppose we have an s function given to us as 1 plus t times the square root of t. Notice that I put a little tail on my square roots I may have mentioned before. And when I do that, that allows me to tell where the square root ends. That's a good thing to do when you're writing mathematics by hand. Solution. All right, the first thing I'm going to do here is rewrite the function because I don't like having to deal with square root symbols. I'd rather have to deal with something that is a power that I know how to work with. And uh, in fact, we probably will have to do a little extension here of what we've done before. But let me show you how that might work. So. First of all, let me rewrite this as s equals 1 plus t times t to the 1 half. Now, we have actually done this before. We looked at this earlier and found out what its derivative was. But I'm going to go ahead and extend what we've done, extend a rule that we'll justify later. And the rule is the power rule. Remember, the power rule we used before was only for integers. It was plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, or 0, and so on. It turns out that the power rule always also works for powers that are fractions. We haven't quite done that, but for the sake of this example, I wanted to show this to you, even though we have actually worked out this derivative earlier using the definition for the square root. In this case, then, the derivative comes out to be 1 plus t left alone, the first member of the product is left alone, times the derivative of the second one, and assuming that rule holds, 1 half t to the minus 1 half, plus the second one left alone, t to the 1 half, times the derivative of the first, 
derivative of 1 is 0 plus the derivative of t is 1. And let's do some algebra here because it's good practice. And we have these negative powers floating around, at least one here. So what do we have here? We have 1 plus t over 2 times t to the 1 half plus, and t to the 1 half times 1 is just t to the 1 half. If we like, we can put these all over the same denominator. Not a bad thing to do if we're going to work with this later. That will give me 1 plus t, of course, remains. To get the right denominator here, I need to multiply top and bottom by 2 times t to the 1 half. So this will give me 2, and t to the 1 half times t to the 1 half is t. So finally, we end up with a nice, clean expression, 1 plus 3t over 2t to the 1 half as our derivative of this original function. Now, in the future, we'll see that this definition, that this uh, rule applied to half powers or any fractional power is indeed true. But for now, we can just accept this and see that this gives us this. And we got to practice in here a little bit of algebra, which is always helpful. Once you have a product rule, I suppose you expect a quotient rule. So that's what we'll do next, the quotient rule. Once again with the quotient rule, we will observe that what you might intuitively think is the correct quotient rule, that the derivative of a quotient, f of x over g of x, you might think is equal to the derivative of f of x over the derivative of g of x. That turns out to be, just as in the product rule case, completely false. It just isn't true, even though we wish it were. It would make things very simple, but it's not true. A counterexample to illustrate that, so that you'll be convinced that even in a very simple case, it's not true. Again, I will let f of x be equal to 1, and I will let g of x be equal to x. So on the left, I get the derivative with respect to x of 1 over x. And that, of course, is x to the minus 1. So when I take the derivative, I'll know how to do it. The question is, is that equal to the derivative of the f function, which is 1, over the derivative of the g function, which is x? On the left, I have this derivative of x to the minus 1. I know how to do that. That's minus 1 times x to the minus 2. And the question will be, is that equal to the derivative of 1, which is 0, that being a constant, and the derivative of x, which is 1? And if we simplify this a little bit more, we have minus 1 over x squared. And we ask the question, is that equal to 0? Well, of course it's not. For no value of x, assuming that 1 over x is defined, meaning x isn't 0, if you put any non-zero number in here, this is a negative number. And it's certainly not equal to 0. So even in this simple case, and again, almost any pair of f of x and g's you choose will cause this to fail, you see that the quotient rule cannot be this. It cannot be that the derivative of a quotient is the quotient of derivatives. So we need to find out what it actually is. I will tell you what it actually is in this case. I will not prove it, as I did in the case of the product rule. The proof is just technical, and there's no need to go through it. If f and g are, and I'll abbreviate again, differentiable diff at x, then the quotient rule says the derivative with respect to x of the quotient f of x over g of x actually exists, assuming the quotient exists, of course, and is equal to the following. Well, it's helpful that the quotient rule does produce a quotient. But the quotient that is here is not what you'd expect. Here's the way I like to remember it. You start with the g on the bottom and put it on the bottom here and square it. No derivatives involved here. You're just squaring the denominator of the quotient. Then on the top, you start with the same function g. So g gets squared here, and then you start with g on the top. You write g of x, and you multiply it times the derivative of f. This is reminiscent of the product rule. This is the second function times the derivative of the first, or in this case, the top function. What is different here is that you have a negative sign. 
And since you're going to have a negative sign, you have to know which thing comes first. That's why I said think of the G going to here and then up to here. The other expression is exactly the reverse of the first expression, just as in the product rule. It's f of x times the derivative of g with respect to x of g of x. So the two expressions here are the same as in the product rule, but you have to remember which one goes first because there's a negative sign in between. And the way I remember it, as I say, is if it's f over g, the g comes down and gets squared, and then the g is what starts off the top. And then you can know which one comes first, and then you put the subtraction in there. So you want to practice this as much as possible. We also write, again, if we think of f of x as simply the function u, not mentioning the x, or and the function g as v, not mentioning the x, we can write this a little bit more simply and with a nice rhythm to it sometimes. The derivative of u over v is going to be v du dx minus u dv dx all over v squared. And again, you start with the v. If you're trying to remember how this works, you square the v and then you let the v start the top. So the derivative of u over v is v du dx minus u dv dx over v squared. This rule takes a little getting used to and quite a lot of practice, so you should get started as soon as you can. Let me do an example here to get you started. Example, the question here is to find dy dx. And here's the y. It is equal to x cubed plus 2x squared minus 1 all over x plus 5. So that is indeed a quotient. And to find this derivative, we should probably use the quotient rule. Although, let me give you a piece of advice. Since the quotient rule is fairly complicated, if you have a quotient, at least pause for a moment and ask yourself, is this a real quotient? Is it possible that I could get x plus 5 to divide into the top part so that I have something that didn't involve a quotient? That probably is worth checking and seeing if that's true. Because if it is, you can avoid the quotient rule entirely, which most of the time you want to do. But in this case, it's a legitimate quotient. There's nothing to do but apply the rules, so let's do it. So dy dx is going to produce a quotient. The bottom is going to be x plus, y, x plus 5 sorry, squared. So we square that. On the top, we have x plus 5. Again, it's, this is the g value. So that's what gets squared, and that's what starts off the top, times the derivative of this function, which is 3x squared plus 4x minus 0, the derivative of a polynomial we've done before, minus, minus is part of the rule, so you have to have it there, and then we reverse this. Instead of having the denominator or the bottom function times the derivative of the top, we reverse it. We now have the top function times the derivative of the denominator, which in this case is just 1, or 1 plus 0 if you like. So there is our quotient rule applied, and technically we are done. This is the derivative of this function. Now, in many cases, finding the derivative is only the first part of a problem. In an applied problem, certainly this is only the first part. So you'd want to learn how to simplify this. I am not going to walk through all the algebra here, but if you do, this simplifies a little bit to 2x cubed plus 17x squared plus 20x plus 1, all over x plus 5 squared. And my advice to you is if you have something like x plus 5 squared in the denominator and none of it factors and simplifies out the top, then leave it as x plus 5 squared. Do not multiply it out. This way you can preserve the structure. That's just a little algebraic hint. One more note on the quotient rule before I leave it. There is a handy fact that's worth noting. Sometimes we're interested in finding the derivative of 1 over a function, 1 over f of x, the reciprocal of the function. Now this is a quotient, but it's a particularly simple quotient. It's a quotient where the top function is a constant. So you would expect that the quotient rule applied to this somehow ought to simplify out. Well, let's do it here in general so we'll be able to remember it. By the quotient rule, this should be the bottom squared, f of x squared. Then we start off the top with f of x times the derivative of 1, which is 0. That's what's going to disappear. Times the top, which is 1, or minus the top times the derivative of the bottom, which is f prime of x, or f prime of x. 
Since this term here is zero, we can simplify this and say this is minus the derivative of the function over the function squared. So the reciprocal has this as its derivative, and that occasionally becomes useful. Again, if I were to write this with u's and v's, in this case I only need a u, or 1 over v, say, since we've used v on the bottom, I'd write 1 over v is going to be minus dv dx over v squared. Sometimes that's helpful, and it's worth noting that it just comes out of the quotient rule. Of course, if you know the quotient rule, you can go ahead and just do this directly if you like. But like I say, sometimes this is handy. And with that, it's time for you to practice the quotient rule. Having the product rule and the quotient rule, it's time to do some practice. I'll do a couple of exercises here to get us started. The first one will be this. Find the derivative with respect to x of y, but we want to evaluate it at the point x equal 1. So we'll have to actually do two things here. Find the derivative and then evaluate it when x is equal to 1. And here is the function y equals 3x plus 2 over x times x to the minus fifth plus 1. There is your problem. Give it a try. Let's see how we might think about this problem as we start working on a solution. The first thing I notice is that I have a quotient here as this first expression multiplied by another expression. The first quotient, however, looks to me like something I could rewrite and not have a quotient, which would make it easier for me to deal with and I could avoid the quotient rule entirely. So I'm going to go ahead and rewrite that. I'll rewrite this as y equals, let's see, 3x over x would give me just 3, that's helpful, plus, well, 2 over x doesn't simplify nicely, but I can rewrite it as 2 times x to the minus 1, and I know how to do powers, so that's easy. The second part, there's nothing to do, I'll just leave that alone. And now I'm ready to look at this as an application of the product rule, possibly followed by other rules for the inner parts. So let's go ahead and look at that. So dy dx, which is what I want to get first, is going to be the derivative of the product rule, the pr derivative of this product. Here's that product again. So the first thing I do will leave this first expression alone. That is 3 plus 2 times x to the minus 1 power. And then I will multiply by the derivative of the second expression, which is minus 5 times x to the minus 6 plus a 0, because the derivative of 1 is 0. I will then add to that the second expression, x to the minus 5th plus 1 untouched, times the derivative of the first, and there's the first right there, so I can just do its derivative directly. The derivative of 3 is 0. Derivative of 2x to the minus 1. The 2 is a constant, so it stays out front, and the minus 1 will come down. So I'd have minus 2x to the minus 2. Now there's my derivative, and if I were interested in working with this expression later, I would certainly want to simplify this. However, here, remember what it is we're trying to do. We're trying to find dy dx evaluated at x equals 1. So there's no need for me to do simplification here. I can just leave it that way, and then substitute in the 1 and see how much simpler it gets with the 1. So with that in mind, I will now have 3 plus, if I put a 1 in for x to the minus 1, I just get 1. So it's 3 plus 2. The second expression here, the 0 doesn't affect anything. The x to the minus 6 is just a 1, so that's minus 5. Plus, this is 1 plus 1, so I have 1 plus 1 here, times, and now I'll have minus 2, if that's replaced by a 1. So this becomes much simpler to look at. 5 times minus 5 is minus 25. This is 2 times minus 2 is minus 4. So I end up with minus 29. That's what I was looking for. What is the derivative of this function evaluated at x equal 1? Now, if my goal was to find the derivative of the function in general and maybe use it in some other sense, I certainly would want to simplify this. It'd be silly to stay with this complicated expression. But if this is the only question, save yourself some trouble. Put the 1 in immediately and get up 
to your answer, minus 29. Now, let's look at a second question. A second question is, find all values of x at which the tangent line, and when you hear the word tangent line, the word derivative should be running through your head. The tangent line to the curve is horizontal. And here's the curve, y equals x squared plus 1 over x minus 1. So find all values of x at which the tangent line to this curve is horizontal. Give that a try. For this problem, we want to understand what it is we need to do. We want to find all values of x at which the tangent line to the curve is horizontal. Let's see. Let's first write down a couple of notes. The answer to this, first of all, let us remind ourselves that the horizontal tangent, any horizontal tangent, is horizontal so it has slope equal to zero. A horizontal tangent has slope zero. Now, if I want to find tangent lines that have that slope, I need a formula for the slope of tangent lines, and I have one. The derivative of any function is a formula for tangent slopes. Okay, here is our original function. Let me just rewrite it here for convenience. x squared plus 1 over x minus 1. It is indeed a quotient, and if I want to examine tangents, and therefore tangent slopes, I will need to find its derivative. So let's do that. The derivative with respect to x of this function, since it is a quotient, we'll need the quotient rule. So we start with the bottom and square it, so x minus 1 squared. The top expression starts with the bottom expression, x minus 1, times the derivative of the top expression here, which is 2x plus 0, but I'll just write 2x, minus, remember minus is part of the quotient rule, minus the reverse procedure. Instead of the bottom function times the derivative of the top, it'll now be the top function times the derivative of the bottom, and the derivative of x minus 1 is easy. That's just 1. So let's simplify this. Because I want to use this later, my aim at that point will be to, to use this uh, to find out where the tangents are horizontal. I will want to have this as simple as I can. So if I multiply some things out, I get here 2x squared minus 2x minus x squared minus 1, running that minus sign through there, over x minus 1 squared, which finally simplifies to x squared minus 2x minus 1 all over x minus 1 squared. So there is my derivative, which remember is a formula for tangent slopes. What did I want? I want the tangents to have slope 0, and I want to find all the x values that make the tangents have slope 0. So if I set this slope formula equal to 0 and then solve for x, I will have my solution. So we want to find x such that the derivative is equal to 0. Now, the derivative is this expression that we saw a moment ago, which is a quotient. The only way a quotient can be 0, remember, is if the top is 0. So we want then x squared minus 2x minus 1 to be 0. So this is a quadratic equation, something you should remember from your days in algebra. It turns out this is not one that factors very nicely, so we'll have to use the quadratic formula. So using the quadratic formula, which is a good thing to have in your toolkit, we write that x is equal to, let's see, it's minus b, so minus the coefficient of x, which will give me a 2 in this case, plus or minus the square root of b squared, that's the coefficient of x squared, that's 4 minus 4 times a, which is the coefficient of x squared, which is just a 1, times c, which is minus 1. And this is all over 2 times a, which is the coefficient of x squared, so that's just a 2. Now the rest is just a little bit of algebra. This is 2 plus or minus 
4 plus 4 is 8, but I will write that as 4 times 2 because I want to see that 4 I can take the square root of, so this becomes 2 plus or minus 2 square root of 2 all over 2, so the 2 can divide into the top, leaving me with 1 plus or minus the square root of 2. These are the two values of x, so there are two x values here, at which the derivative is 0, meaning at which the graph of the function will have horizontal tangents. So I found the answer to the question. It is these two x values, 1 plus square root of 2 and 1 minus square root of 2.